Welcome everyone, so excited to see so many of you here. Um, we're really happy that you were able to join our session today. My name is Maya Sabatello. I have a curly dark hair and round glasses, and I'm an associate professor of medical sciences here at Columbia University. I'm delighted to launch this, to continue this seminar speaker series, Disability Ethics, Intersectionality in AI ML Bias, which is co-sponsored co by Columbia's Center for Precision Medicine and Genomics, the Division of Ethics, and the Department of Biomedical Informatics. The seminar speaker is funded by the National Human Genome Research Institute. It's part of an effort to engage in interdisciplinary dialogue about the experiences of people with disability in healthcare, research, and society at large, to explore how existing perceptions, practices, systems, and structures may affect the well being of this population, and think about how the disciplines of ethics, medicine, social sciences, and biomedical informatics can support more equitable outcomes for people with disability, both at the group level, as well as at the intersection of disability and other forms of marginalization, such as gender, race, and ethnicity. For this purpose, we invite speakers to share their work and insights on issues and challenges that arise with regards to people with disabilities in medicine, big data, and emerging technologies. Today, I'm delighted that Dr. Cindy Bennett has accepted our invitation to present on her work in this series. Now, before we move on to her presentation, I wanna say a few housekeeping notes. Um, one, this is a hybrid event, which we are recording. We, are, we also have a live captioner, and if it doesn't work from you automatically from your device, there's a link that we posted in the chat, and you can use that. The structure for our seminar is that the speakers present for about 45 minutes, followed by Q&A that we, we invite from the audience, and we will alternate between in-person and remote attendees. So if you're in the room, raise your hand and we'll call up on you. If you're on Zoom, please post your question in the chat box and we will read it out loud. We will circulate an attendance sheet here for people who are in the room, um, so if you can please fill it out. If you want to join our listservs and know, learn about future events, please let me know as well. Um, and then last comment before we jump into today's event. Our next event, just so you have it on your radars, will be on Thursday, April 20th at 12 p.m. And we will host Dr. And Andy Hasley, uh, who will discuss universal designs for learning in data science. So please pencil it in. All right, now, now for the main reason that we're here today, and I'd love to introduce our speaker. So Dr. Bennett is a senior research scientist at Google's, in Google's Responsible AI and Human-Centered Technology Organization. Her research concerns the intersection of AI ethics and disability. Dr. Bennett is regularly invited to speak. Recent hosts include Stanford and Apple. And she previously worked at Carnegie Mellon University, Apple, the University and the University of Washington. Her work has received grant funding from Microsoft Research and the National Science Foundation, and eight of her peer-reviewed publications have received awards. Dr. Bennett is a disabled woman scholar working in the tech and academic sectors, and she works to increase awareness of people who are systematically excluded from STEM. Today, Dr. Bennett will share with us some of her work with a talk titled Disability Accessibility and Fairness in Artificial Intelligence. And with that, please welcome her with me. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm really excited um, to be here. So I'll start with just a brief description of myself. Uh, I'm a blind white woman with long uh, dark brown hair and I'm wearing a very dramatic cream statement piece um, made by one of my friends who's a textiles artist. Um, and today uh, I do want to note that there will be a couple of slides, um, racist and transphobic content. I'll give you a warning before those slides in case you'd like to step away. All right, next slide. So as an agenda for today, I'll first give some background on topics that I'll discuss. And then I will provide some examples of AI bias as it relates to accessibility and disability. I'll then um, talk about some challenges accessibility researchers have encountered when trying to prevent or mitigate such bias. And I'll do a deep dive on a project I did on representation, AI, and alt text. And I will conclude with some recommendations. Next slide. 
So I will transition to the background. Next slide. About 15% of people worldwide have disabilities, and disabilities are mismatches between people's bodies and minds in the environment that systematically limit their full participation. And disability is also a culture and identity for some people. Next slide. About 285 million people worldwide experience blindness or low vision. And I'll focus um, a lot of this talk on the 39 million people who are blind. Blind people use screen readers, which speak out to displayed content and enable keyboard and non-visual gesture interaction. Screen readers are a key technology that blind people use to access alt text, um, which I will describe next on the next slide. So alt text is a method to make visual information accessible for blind people. Alt is an HTML attribute where content creators can write text descriptions of images that show up if the image is absent and importantly, are read out loud by screen readers. Several productivity suites, including Microsoft and Google, also offer content creators the ability to add alt text to images in addition to being able to do it on websites. And using a screen reader, a person focusing on this image would um, hear its alt text, which um, reads that um, several people in a street using wheelchairs um, in, in an image, uh, sorry, an American flag with stars arranged in the accessibility symbol is held up in the background. Next slide. But many images posted online do not have alt text, meaning if you cannot see them, you do not have access to them. A 2022 survey by WebAIM, which is a well-respected accessibility consultancy, found that one third of popular home pages had missing or uninformative alt text last year. Additionally, um, this chart shows that about 0.1% of images posted on Twitter during a data collection period in 2018 had alt text. So there's a lot of missing alt text on the internet. And next slide. This slide is a diversion from my talk, but given the audience, I wanted to point out a potential impact of missing alt text. Health information is often publicized through images. And as the COVID-19 pandemic set in, only 12 out of all US state and federal health departments used alt text on Twitter and used it in only 56% of their images, which were communicating crucial public health information like case counts, who should get tested, and how to get more information. So there's a really easy way that people like you and in the medical field can make information more accessible just by adding alt text. Next slide. Now, AI may be a solution to low rates of alt text by scaling its production. In fact, several companies have released products um, that automate information access. So this slide features apps from Apple, Google, and Microsoft, which use techniques from machine learning, computer vision, and natural language processing to convert pixels and images into text. Next slide. So now that I've gone over some background, I'll transition to talk about AI bias. Next slide. I will talk about just a few types of AI bias at a higher level, and there are many examples. I encourage you to use this just as a starting point for your own learning um, about its impacts on people. The examples I'll go over today um, include AI relying on averages, alt text misclassification, and data may exclude disability. Next slide. AI relies on averages. This slide shows a data distribution with a few clusters and a few outliers. Many data sets used to train uh, machine learning models reflect the most common, not the most representative data. This means that data considered to be at the margins which often includes data associated with many people with disability or accessibility needs, just simply won't be in the data set. Um, so, you know, this reliance on averages has some real impacts um, on the way models are developed and then on how they tend to be evaluated. Next slide. Next, AI, AI may misclassify information. And this has an impact in accessibility use cases, including automatically generated alt text. 
So in some cases, um, groups of pixels and images may not be labeled in a representative way in training data. So for example, some bias that I've seen before is like when women are wearing professionalized uniforms or have short hairstyles, maybe they're labeled as men because most of the things and data sets that are wearing those things are men, even though that doesn't necessarily mean it should be associated with men. So there's misgendering because of unrepresentative data. But also there are situations where people's identity doesn't even, isn't even counted for, and it might be difficult or impossible to account for this. So consider this image of Layla from the Disabled and Here stock collection. This collection is great because each photography wrote information about who they are along with their image. So we know that Layla identifies as black, non-binary and disabled. Yet most model training does not consider gender beyond two binary genders and has yet to classify um, disability systematically at all. So in some ways, we might think about doing better by improving learned associations in machine learning model training as to not rely on gender stereotypes. But in some ways, we have to ask whether it's appropriate to classify certain categories or whether certain categories are even classifiable with things like gender. Um, thinking about the potential harms that may happen if the classification is incorrect or how those classifications could potentially be misused. Next slide. The last form of bias I will expand on is missing data such as disability data and some downstream impacts that can happen as a result. So in this image, you will see Emily Ackerman, who is a wheelchair user, and Emily encountered a delivery robot in a curb cut. She was crossing a street and really needed that robot to move out of the way. Whereas people walking could choose to not use the curb cut, Emily relied on it. While this robot is proprietary and we don't technically know how it works, it demonstrates that if AI does not recognize someone, it could potentially act in inappropriate and unsafe ways. Unfortunately, delivery robots could be quite useful for people with disabilities if they were robust to the diverse people, things, and public infrastructures that they would have to encounter. Emily's advocacy actually led to her being cyberbullied online uh, more than it led to a productive communication um, for change. And I would encourage you to look up her accounts of this experience online for more information. Next slide. So next I'll talk about some challenges accessibility researchers have encountered when trying to apply AI to solve accessibility um, barriers. Um, and mitigate some of these biases that I talked about. Next slide. These challenges include there are performance inconsistencies which may interfere with accessibility, acquiring inclusive data, and accessible verification challenges. Next slide. Performance inconsistencies may interfere with the accessibility that is trying to be addressed through some of these applications. So often developers have to make trade-offs. Uh, okay. Often developers have to make trade-offs between immediate application and accuracy. So since outputs from common machine learning applications are probabilistic, um, meaning some of the output could actually be unpredictable and, and it's hard to kind of account for all of this. And this has implications for accessibility applications um, like this um, person, Laura, who is a blind user of technology. And Laura wrote a day in the life um, in an article that you can read about her experiences using technology. So she wrote about one task that where she used an AI tool. She said, my daughter wants to wear her yellow tights today. And my partner has left the house and the fabric on each pair of tights feels the same, not giving any clues as to what color they are. So I use a color identification app, again, taking a photo of the tights and um, the technology lets me know its color. Orange, the app replies. My daughter only has yellow, blue, and white tights. So I guess that orange probably means yellow and I get her dress. So Laura had to have prior knowledge to deduce that orange means yellow. It's great that she has access to this color recognition app, but it also creates different types of labor for her that often go under recognized in technology design. 
focusing on um, quality improvements for specific use cases to be a difficult argument to make for machine de uh, learning developers because often they want their models to be generalizable. But accessibility kind of begs us to ask why generalizability is the goal. And I've seen some recent research where users can actually personalize their own on-device machine learning models to do things like recognize their speech better or uh, recognize sounds in the environment. And so personalized models might be a really promising avenue to address these trade-offs. Next slide. So next I'll share some challenges related to collecting inclusive data. First, finding enough data is difficult as often people underrepresented in existing data sets or either low incidence, in other words, there just aren't a lot of people like them in the world, or a lot of the internet archives that exist don't include them. Maybe their communities haven't had access to the internet, maybe they're historically underrepresented. Next, some people may not want to disclose personal information like disability, and for good reason, as um, disclosing disability can be dangerous. There's and Americans with Disabilities Act for a reason. There's a history of discrimination. People might not feel comfortable sharing that data. Next, people with disabilities are a heterogeneous population using inconsistent terms to describe themselves. So it's really hard to know that even if someone is using the terms you're looking for, whether their actual data qualifies for your data set. For example, some people identify as disabled, some people don't. People with the same disability label can present in different ways. And finally, creating synthetic data, which is common, especially in personal or healthcare training data um, sets, can lead to disability stereotypes. So it's really important to look out for stuff like this. So I'll give an example regarding augmented communicators. Augmented communicators use technology like switches and eye gaze to type. Um, and often the process is very slow. There's not very efficient technology for um, these users. And so um, several years ago, some researchers asked crowd workers to type sentences in order to create a data set specialized to this population. So they asked crowd workers, type sentences that you think augmented communicators would type. And what happened is these crowd workers over um, kind of focused on medical sentences, like I need someone to take me to the doctor um, or bring me some soup. So this overrepresented an association between disability and medical care, which is a stereotype and does not represent what people with disabilities actually want to talk about every day. However, authentic data collection is really difficult. As I mentioned, text entry can be very fatiguing for people who use switches and eye gaze. And so this is a big tension in how to acquire inclusive data in a thoughtful manner. Um, and there may be a place for synthetic data, but really being attuned to look out um, for avoiding um, those stereotypes if that's the avenue you need to, to take. Next slide. On the note of inclusive data, I did want to mention the Speech Accessibility Project launched in 2022. It's a cross-industry initiative sponsored by Amazon, Apple, Google, Meta, and Microsoft um, to collect a diverse, uh, a diverse speech set um, training speech recognition models to do better at recognizing atypical speech. Um, but it's being administered by the University of Illinois um, in order to keep it more privacy preserving and open. So I give this example as a potential way um, to think about inclusive data sets for low incidence populations, maybe sharing and um, going in on a multi institution effort can be a promising effort. Next slide. Finally, I'll talk about accessible verification challenges. One way to mitigate harm in AI systems is to give users tools to understand um, why they got certain outputs. However, some applications of AI for accessibility remediate fundamentally inaccessible information. For example, alt text provides access to images that blind people either cannot see or may not be able to see enough to get a sense of whether the automatic alt text they are reading should be taken seriously. There isn't a lot of research in this area, and I really hope there is more, um, because in 2016, I, uh, some colleagues and I looked at how blind people trusted automatic alt text, and they tended to over trust it. So, for example, we showed this image of Hillary Clinton standing on a stage to um, a participant. The tweet um, text reads, some on the other side may say that our best days are behind us. 
let's prove them wrong. And if you'll remember in 2016, this is when Hillary Clinton was running for president. The AI generated alt text read, I'm not really uh, confident, but I think it's a man doing a trick on a skateboard at night. Even though the confidence rating was low, this participant said, I probably just would have retweeted it thinking it was a photo of a skateboarder. I would be in so much trouble by my friends. People would be like, I thought we don't get political. So this example is extreme, but you can imagine that even more subtle mistakes may be harder to convey uncertainty about. And sometimes the potential um, consequences of an incorrect description are kind of determined by the context. In this case, Hillary Clinton being a politician, running for president at the time, and this participant not wanting to come off as too political online. And those types of things so far are indeterminable by AI. Accessible verification or explainability is a big open question. Um, and most of the tools that have been developed to help um, users to kind of have healthy skepticism actually rely on visualization. So there's a lot of space for accessibility research in this area. Next slide. So now I'll transition to talk about my project on representation, AI, and alt text. Next slide. Um, this uh, project turned in um, to uh, a, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself, sorry. Um, so uh, this, since um, representation is really um, important in US culture, um, so if you'll consider, um, I just lost my place for a second, sorry. Um, all right. So appearance and identity, or what is popularly called representation, matters in US society, but often representation information is communicated only visually. So let's consider this text description Disney Plus has written about the musical Hamilton that a blind reader would encounter. It says Hamilton has taken the story of American founding father Alexander Hamilton and created a revolutionary movement um, in theater, a musical that has had a profound impact um, on culture, politics, and education. Next slide. So now let's consider this image of Hamilton cast members. So people who can see this image and who are marginally aware of predominant white US history narratives will immediately understand that um, the racially diverse cast with several black and Hispanic actors is making a statement that is only hinted at in the language of the non-visual description. So in this case and in many others, understanding the appearance and identity of um, cast is cru crucial to understand Hamilton and to participating in discourse about it. So as I proceed in this talk, I'm going to talk a lot about representation and it might feel like I am reducing people's appearance and identity to labels. I do wanna acknowledge that people are much more complicated than any words they may use to describe themselves. But since alt text um, you know, does consist of these brief descriptions, I think it's important to think about how this language is being used. Next slide. Also, some AI generated alt text already contains appearance information. So this alt text for Microsoft seeing AI app has given this person a gender and an age label. Next slide. So now I'll go over the study that I ran that turned into a paper called It's Complicated, Negotiating Accessibility in Misrepresentation in Image Descriptions of Race, Gender, and Disability. Next slide. I interviewed 25 blind people who also experienced marginalization based on their race and or gender. I took up intersectionality by contemporary Black feminists um, because I knew that interviewing people with just one touch point into this experience um, would not reveal impacts necessary to understand this development space. I turned to this intersection because blind people benefit from alt text to understand visual information, yet people minoritized based on their race and gender have been actually shown to be most often misclassified and harmed by similar AI technologies as the ones used to generate alt text. So I thought that we would learn some pretty important trade-offs to consider. Next slide. 
Participants brought um, sample photos of themselves to um, an interview study that I ran to anchor our discussions. I asked them questions about their image browsing and posting behaviors, uh, their experiences being misrepresented, contexts in which they seek representation about others, and um, their prefer preferred language to describe themselves based on the relationship they have with the describer. Like if the describer is a known contact to them, if a describer is a stranger, and also their kind of preferences around AI generated alt text. Next slide. These tables show the self-reported recent gender makeup of participants. I interviewed several people who are non-binary, transgender and agender, and people who are black, Asian American and Latinx. Next slide. So I'll start by overviewing my findings by sharing um, the impacts of misrepresentation on participants in the next two slides that have some racist and transphobic content. And so I encourage you to step away if you need to for a minute. Um, so next slide. Participant experiences being mis misrepresented varied from it being a microaggression, so not having a huge impact, but building up over time, for, to it to contributing to dysphoria or a profound sense of unease or dissatisfaction. Misrepresentation occurred outside the context of alt text, but contributed to participant perspectives on alt text. So for example, Sophie, has been misrepresented by blind people in person based on how she sounds. She said, when blind people find out that I'm Indian, they'll be like, oh, I thought you were blonde or I thought you were a white girl. You talk like a white girl. And Sophie would ask herself, what am I supposed to sound like? Sophie's experiences being represented by blind people emphasized to her the importance that all texts be accurate. Next slide. Some participants had used products that assigned a gender to people in images. Creo said, seeing AI, which is an episode on a previous slide, um, it typically tries to shove you into one characterization or another. Sometimes I'm a 35 year old woman looking happy. Sometimes I'm a 50 year old man looking happy. And based on this experience, um, Creo felt like this product would not be able to represent them. Next slide. Um, are we on the participants wanted to know? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for helping me keep up. Um, participants agreed, however, that even though they had been misrepresented and those experiences were harmful, the representation information is very important. So um, they kind of shared some context in which they would want to know this information. Some wanted to know it all the time, understanding it to be embedded in societal interactions, whether made explicit or not. But also they understood that alt text is generally supposed to be pretty brief um, and provide just a summary. And so they outlined some specific contexts in which they really thought this information was important. So for example, when race, gender, or disability was the topic of conversation, the participants expressed that everyone in the conversation needed to position themselves non-visually. So that's what I did at the beginning of this talk by identifying myself as a blind white woman. Um, and others wanted to know representation information about uh, media icons like Hamilton, so they could understand um, who to support or, or what media was representing or not representing. Others wanted to be able to understand representation in their immediate vicinity, either in online or offline spaces, to understand who they're around um, and maybe to find community. And also some participants wanted um, to understand representation in terms of choosing products that might work for them. Next slide. I've elaborated on um, just one of these contexts with a quote um, for the sake of time on the value of being able to be a room and find community. So Kai talked about taking an online course and um, she reflected, we all were asked to post a picture to introduce ourselves. And then I got an invitation to join a black, indigenous, and people of color subgroup of the training. Group members could instantly ask me, but I did not unfortunately have the same opportunity. So Kai and others had to rely on sighted people sometimes to be able to find community um, and understand who was around them. This didn't feel particularly fair to them. 
the next slide. Participants differentiated potential representation descriptions by identity and appearance information. So identity descriptions could be applied when race, gender, or disability could be confirmed by the person writing the alt text. And these exceeded the purely visual perception um, to culturally significant, such as identifying as Black. But participants agreed that this was sometimes relevant, particularly in the context I described. But in cases when um, alt text author cannot confirm um, the identity descriptions, appearance information like skin tone, clothing, hairstyles, accessories, and access technologies were pe perceived of by participants as um, helpful. Um, and I want to be clear that these recommendations are not meant to conflate appearance with identity because those are not the same thing but to offer a pathway in order to try not to make assumptions um, if that information is unknown. Next slide. So I'll give some examples of a potential description based on different contexts. Um, and here's the base description going back to our image of Layla. So the base would be a person with a filtering face mask, walks down a neighborhood street, one hand on their pocket and the other on their cane. Um, they have a short mohawk and are wearing a jacket, shorts, tennis shoes, and jeans. And the bracketed phrase, a person will change. So next slide. So first, if the human describers know the identity of someone, they could write a Black, disabled, non-binary person, as we learned from Layla's own description. And on the next slide, when a human describer doesn't know a photograph used preferred language, they could use um, an alt text to describe the appearance instead, like a person with dark skin. And you'll notice that um, skin tone label replaced race, and there's no disability or gender label. And the accessory information later on in the caption um, gives kind of some other information without maybe making assumptions about their identity. Next slide. The next example also accounts for the broader audience. So when the audience is known and not public, just someone's name is necessary. Participants talked about in their circles of friends, they really didn't need these reminders. And on the next slide, when the audience is public to increase representation in the media, both Layla's name and the descriptive phrase could be used so that um, people getting to know Layla could better connect their name with who they are and how they present. Next slide. So next I'll talk about um, participants' different perspectives of AI-generated descriptions of appearance and identity. Some participants found alt text so rarely that they agree with Parker who said, I favor something rather than nothing, even if some of these descriptions are wrong. And while some people might think, oh, well, that means this is okay, I would challenge that we should also be thinking about what sacrifices we ask people to make by using technology and kind of whether those sacrifices kind of lean on legacies of oppression, like asking someone to accept the fact that they will be misrepresented in order to have access to information. On the other hand, um, some people like Tracy and Yvonne caution the use of AI to generate appearance and identity labels. Um, Tracy pointed out the labor of misrepresentation by saying, it's just more thing, one more microaggression that I have to put up with from technology that's supposed to help. I would hate it if every time I upload a photo, um, I would have to change it so that it doesn't say age or misgender. And that's even being optimistic that Tracy would have the option to change that information. Yvonne um, thought about AI bias um, kind of for, in the context of, of her life and, and the, the potential for it to um, perpetuate existing discrimination thing, um, you know, the people who are going to be impacted are often already bearing the brunt of so much other stuff, like anti-Black messaging on social media that she had experienced. Um, she said it would just be compounded if AI was giving me biased information. So for Yvonne and others, um, the goal was not necessarily around de-biasing AI, but on limiting its usage, given how it's already been used to um, cause harm. So um, on the next slide, I've um, just shared a few um, kind of ideas for promoting um, a kind of potential design considerations, as we call them in my field, for uh, promoting kind of more awareness around the importance of visual descriptions. 
um, thinking about making visual descriptions um, easier to discover and encourage like recent efforts to add pronouns. Um, often platforms will hide um, alt text fields and give users no advice on how to write alt text. So there's a great opportunity to incorporate kind of best practices into platforms. Um, alt text authors and really everyone needs to kind of think critically about differences between identity um, and not enforcing that people disclose identities that they might not be out about. Um, but also thinking about clever ways of describing appearance, giving people information about what is actually visible, um, and kind of thinking critically about that difference in offering descriptions to make sure that people are able to stay safe um, and only share what is comfortable. And also, um, if for kind of AI researchers, um, thinking about allowing users to opt in to AI-generated descriptions, um, potentially choose preferred language, which could then be integrated into AI-generated image descriptions. Um, and so these design considerations aim to kind of increase the awareness around the importance of representation, um, and as well as kind of grapple with the fact that it might not always be appropriate for AI to do this work, um, but there might be ways to build in and transparency into these processes um, to kind of get the best of both worlds in terms of like human in the loop type of solutions. So next slide. Now I'll transition to share some recommendations and resources about AI bias um, at, a, um, at a higher level. Um, so the recommendations on the next slide, the recommendations include advocating throughout the development pipeline, Cycle, identifying risk, partnering with communities and setting expectations. So on the next slide. So first, um, on this slide, I'm just showing a very, very generic version of the machine learning development um, pipeline. And just want to point out that at each phase of development, there are opportunities for bias to be introduced and there's opportunities to mitigate it. So as an example, when you are thinking about what data sets you need to collect, there's opportunities to make sure we're not thinking about the most, the easiest data to find, but maybe we need to do intentional data collections to um, represent underrepresented people in that data um, and, and give them similar weight. During development, there's important ways to think about how the model is trained, um, making sure it doesn't create learned associations that pull on stereotypes that will perpetuate those stereotypes. Um, thinking about different options like human in the loop type systems, maybe not completely automating um, solutions, but kind of in invoking opportunities for people to share preferences and customizations. Um, during the evaluation phase, there's op opportunities to make sure that things like disability are even accounted for. So the only things that can be evaluated are what's on the evaluation. So um, there's great opportunities for evaluation design. And I would argue um, incorporating qualitative evaluation in addition to quantitative, um, because often these kind of low or incidence and underrepresented perspectives um, come out in really rich ways through qualitative um, evaluation. And finally, after model launch, there is um, always opportunities to find out how the model is being used in ways that were not anticipated and to really follow up and make improvements um, to address any unanticipated harms. On the next slide, I wanted to share um, the Fairness Action Framework developed by my colleagues, Sherry Truin and um, some others. I actually just think this is really helpful. Um, it, it offers a like, really long list of questions just to help you identify risks um, things like, does it even use human data? How might disability affect input data? Um, just continuing, who might um, be adversely impacted by this application? Who bears the cost of errors? What does fair mean in this application? Who is not represented in the training data? Um, does it drive decisions that impact people? So some, some people might have seen popularized examples like um, AI makes a, a, a judgment and then that decision maybe results in someone's credit score or them being judged as committing academic misconduct or their job application being rejected. So thinking about what, what are the downstream effects? Um, how will we show that this application is fair? Can decisions be challenged or explained? Is there historical discrimination? And that's a big red flag to rely on historic data if there has been. Um, is there feedback loops? So do results 
outputs from this model go back to train the model because that'll just amplify whatever bias started with. Um, and does this use human input to um, control anything? And how well does it work um, when the input is um, affected by disability? What is an alternative when AI um, doesn't work? So this what is the alternative is a really important one. There's been a lot of like recent advancements in like authentication that rely on face ID or touch ID. Well, what if you don't have fingers? What if your face looks different? Making sure users have alternatives um, in, instead of enrolling everyone into this new AI solution is really important. Next slide. So next, I'm guessing that you've probably heard this, but um, I'll just join the crowd and say it's always super important to partner with communities. Um, so I can imagine you could take that fairness action framework and develop a series of conversations with communities and have them help you answer those questions in ways that you probably wouldn't be able to answer on your own. Um, you know, communities can help you identify key terms to search for relevant data sets or to develop relevant data sets. So there's a lot of opportunities and even working with communities to identify whether machine learning is the right approach, because it might not be. Um, and I also um, kind of also recommend incorporating basic machine learning education into these community engagements. So a lot of my experiences working with um, blind users of technology, they just assume that AI is mysterious and they're not supposed to be able to understand it. Well, when I explain things like the development cycle, it's pretty amazing how more feedback and more concerns and more ideas will come out. So there's a real opportunity to give back to communities to kind of demystify machine learning um, as a gift to that community. And it will probably improve the feedback that you get. On the next slide. Um, next, we recommend setting reasonable expectations about AI's capabilities and limitations whenever possible. And there are a lot of touch points to do this. So this could be through explainable interfaces or explainable data, um, conveying uncertainty of outputs or trying to encourage healthy skepticism, incorporating it into user manuals and tutorials. And this is a big one, storytelling and promotion. Often we want to market our research. It's really important to do for our careers, but keeping in mind um, the potential downstream impact when we say things like it reached human parity and being sure to really give details about in what context, under what constraints, um, so that people don't continue to think that AI is just omnipotent um, and never makes mistakes. Next slide. So that is all I have. I have been speaking for a very long time. Really excited to have your questions. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you very much, Dr. Bennett. Let's open it for questions from both the audience and in person. If anyone has a question, raise your hand. Let's see if there's also anything in the chat. Feel free to post there anything. Um, yep, go ahead. Uh, so in your framework, you uh, talked about how we have to be really careful if there's histor historical bias against uh, disabled people, it, then like be really careful about using historical data. And so we pretty much all work with medical data, mm -hmm. which in addition to there being historical bias, there's definitely current bias. Yeah. And so do you have any thoughts on how we can account for that in models and in like how we use the data. Yeah, and thanks for your question. So um, I, the framework is not mine. I, I just wanted to present it. Um, some of my colleagues came up with it and I'm very, very grateful um, for that. So yeah, so you make a really good point that there is still um, current bias um, happening. And I don't know, you know, I, I, I don't know what the, solution is. One thing I, I wonder is if kind of diversifying the approach um, for, for model design in terms of like working with communities to understand what, what are the outcomes that they want and what are potential solutions to, to work toward um, those outcomes that might be able to kind of accompany relying on, on data sets to develop models. So I don't know if that's a very good answer um, to your question. I also wonder if um, there's opportunities to partner with specialists who 
have a lot of experience working with people with disability and might have a concentration of, of disability data that maybe reflects um, more positive medical relationships with different specialists who particularly work on, I don't know if it would be like occupational therapy or physical therapy or gaining certain skills and abilities and whether there's interesting data in the, that that can kind of counteract or balance out or I, I don't know, but I, I will say thank you for that question and I should probably learn a little bit more about some of the existing techniques to, to counteract these stereotypes in actual big data sets, so thank you. Thank you. There's a couple of questions from uh, on the Zoom. One is they're requesting a reference to the framework to identify risks, and if you can send it to me later, I can. Yes, you. I I will. I had um, so Sherry Truin is my colleague at Google, and she developed this framework at her previous employer, and so we were actually chasing it down. So if nothing else, I can send you the list of questions with the reference. Um, and yeah, I'll send that to you. So great. Sorry. <laughs> then there's another question. Yeah. Thanks for the comment, first of all, thank you yeah. for the informative presentation. Can you share any lessons learned on ensuring that AI technologies are accessible and equitable for all users when collaborating with organizations and stakeholders in developing these technologies? One thing I've learned is one of my recommendations that um, when I've talked to, again, blind people about AI bias, I quickly learned that some either did not know what it was or did not connect that what they were seeing on the news about like wrongful arrests, you know, based on computer vision algorithms, that that would have anything to do with the accessible technology that they may rely on. So I actually think one of my biggest lessons was like, of course, you don't want to be patronizing, but I think there are huge gaps and, and the feedback you get will be based on the knowledge that people have. And, um, you know, you don't want to introduce unnecessary fear, but I think sometimes helping people to make those connections and, and to have a little bit of, of knowledge can be empowering. Um, I mean, other, other lessons I've learned is just like there just tends to be a lot of over blowing of how well technology works that's why i showed that slide about laura like the fact that orange means yellow is a very in my personal opinion as a blind person and a researcher is a very real and common experience and so like one of the lessons i've learned is just how often in these papers and presentations we tend to just gloss over and like oh that's a bug or that's not typical with that that is where we are. That is a very typical experience. And there's a lot of really basic improvements um, that would be helpful. And, and maybe it doesn't need to be like, you know, building the, the latest and greatest shiniest thing. There's probably some really basic things like color identification that could even be better. So those are a couple of things. I'm happy to continue the conversation though. Thank you. More questions here? Do you discuss primarily uh, descriptions of people? Yes. But there are a lot of other types of images online. And yeah. um, I'm just curious how, if you've ever looked into these other types of images and whether you have some suggestions about how they should be reflective or in line with some of the work. Like, I think it seems like there's all these programs, like the MEI program, you know, describing what's going on around you when you walk with a, with a mm -hmm. technology. But, mm -hmm. Are there any suggestions more broadly about other images in videos, in films, um, in, uh, in medical records or medical information? How should we be thinking yeah. about it? Yeah, so I haven't, I've done a little bit in the area of automating access to charts and where that's like graphs and charts and where that's at right now is like very basic charts can be sometimes interpreted um but so i think i think one step is to consider solutions in in a particular context and so maybe addressing data visualizations or a particular type of health diagram is extremely useful and i i would say there's a there's kind of a, a pervasive lack of access to health um, and medical information um so i i don't know that i have any solutions that are like machine learning or AI, but often it's just thinking about, am I presenting this information through multiple formats so that people with different learning styles or 
sensory abilities can look at it. So maybe some people really benefit from a diagram. You know, maybe other people need a text description. Maybe other people need a 3D model. So I think even just getting existing knowledge into multiple formats um, can go a long way. Um, I also just think like I give this advice kind of to everyone is thinking about what's the most appropriate tool to share the information. So a lot of images posted online that have maybe things like health information, they don't necessarily have to be images. They could have been typed up as like a text document. So just like thinking critically about like, why am I sharing this as an image? Um, is there ways I could also share it as text? Um, those are some simple things, but I, I, I would be really excited to, to learn about work that is trying to make you know immersive medical information, um, whether through diagrams or um, you know immer more immersive experiences, accessible. I think that'd be very valuable. Thank you. I think there is a uh, two participants. Adrian from the, from Adrian raised her hand. She's on Zoom. Adrian, can you unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes. Hi there. This is Adrian Pichon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you so much for your talk, Dr. Bennett. Uh, it was incredibly interesting. I loved how detailed the descriptions of the examples that you gave. That's really helpful for thinking about how to apply it to our own research. Uh, something that I was thinking about as you were talking um, about filling in without making assumptions and, and how alt text can be really useful for creating you know, lessons in making computational representations without making assumptions and allowing for human feedback in the loop. So I think that's something that I'm really gonna take away from this that I think is very cool. Um, I am wondering if you can maybe share your thoughts on the ideal futures, um, especially thinking about computational advances, the ability to capture context sensors, um, the ability to use AI for, you know, detecting activities of daily living and things like that. And um, what kind of, what ways do you see in the next five or 10 years that are gonna become more uh, doable in the technological sense that might be uh, productive rather than advance bias through automated means? Yeah, thanks for your question. And this actually will allow me to hit on a point that I wanted to mention. So, um, I, I foresee a lot of excitement around um, auto automation and accessibility in certain ways, in ways that can empower people to have more data about themselves um, in an accessible format. And I think that in an accessible format is the part that I'm really excited about for the future because that's not happening right now. So um, as an example, if you think of like exercise tracking or things like that, you know, how is that data shown? It's primarily visual um, or like how is, how are activity trackers in the home being used? They're being used to surveil older and disabled people. Well, what would it look like to put the control in the hands of people with disabilities to not make these um, data as like indications of whether someone should be medicalized or institutionalized, but on how they can you know, take more agency over their own health. Um, so I'd, I'd really love to see um, kind of sensing and data oriented toward empowering um, end users rather than unfortunately often serving um, for kind of over medicalizing or, or over controlling um, people. So, so I'd see it, it's more of a shift in framing an agency and preserving, pr putting in protection so that, um, you know, data is, is empowering the user but not being shared um, unethically. Um, I think there's a lot of great implications for, um, you know, maybe I think of like blind parents who might be, you know, trying to diagnose things that might be happening with their kids, particularly if they can't communicate. And unfortunately, kind of a predominant response has been, oh, if a blind parent doesn't know what's happening, they're an irresponsible parent. So again, reframing it to know, actually, if we had a really accurate reading on like being able to look at skin conditions, and actually be able to give this parent like medically sound empowering advice that actually enhances the good parenting that they're already doing because we start with that assumption. So I think there's a lot of fear in communities of people with disabilities and collaborating in healthcare because of the, the ways that they've been, that information has potentially been used against them. And so I'd love to see different kind of reframings as like, this is meant to in enable the, the good parenting or enable the care that you already give to yourself um, just with more data in an accessible format. And one 
last thing I'll say about that is tech companies that might be working on, you know, might have teams working on accessibility often expressly avoid health applications and will even put disclaimers in, you know, AI tools, terms of service, like this is not meant to serve for any health purpose. So I think there's tons of potential for like actual medical experts to collaborate with accessibility people because the digital accessibility people aren't doing it. They're afraid to do it because of the liability. So there's a there's a huge opportunity. Thank you. I don't see more hands. There's more question here from Felicia. Felicia, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, hi, Dr. Bennett and Felicia. And first of all, I want to say I really like your examples, like share with us, especially uh, the example of the photos, like you mentioned. Um, instead of like saying the race or other identities, maybe it's better for us to describing the uh, the identity of that person. So, for example, like you mentioned, like we can use the darker skin instead of mention the whole race of that. Like you cannot really tell it, what is that is. So, is that really helpful? Like, where is that uh, possible in the later for the machine learning? Like instead of like uh, give the specific uh, give the specific classification or definitions to the photo. You use more describable uh, words like the darker skins or the taller or uh, uh, yeah, other like describable words. Yeah, thanks for your question. So I think um, it's still probably important to be very careful um, in the sense that that those terms can even still be wrong. So as an example, there's kind of a legacy of photography, the way that um, photography works, um, captured lighter skin um, better and digital photography techniques kind of just took on those, um, those discriminatory patterns. And so it's important, like even if we're using appearance terms and not maybe expressly identity terms, they can still be wrong based on the way the picture is taken and the way it's processed. So I think it would still be really important to have those things I talked about, like building in uncertainty, building in um, explainability so users understand like this is not necessarily accurate, um, you know, um, so, so I think that would be really important, um, it, but, but on the note of like skin tone recognition, there are, I, I have seen advances in um, the, the monk scale, which is kind of hosted by Google now has like 10 different um, skin tone options that kind of maybe better reflect a diversity of skin tones that were not, um, I think the Fitzpatrick scale was used before that didn't really reflect. So, so I know it's being worked on, um, and there might be potential for that to be appropriate, but I would still say like with all the things that I recommended around like encouraging healthy skepticism, um, you know, like allowing people to have control over how they're described and things like that. Thank you so, so much. much. Thank, Thank you. you so much for your fantastic talk. It was really great, very informative, okay. very Thanks. helpful. I want to take one more second just to um, Thank everyone who's been helping in organizing this event, including Tony, of course, regarding students, the Justice Informatics and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion groups. Craig, I wanted to give you a shout out for helping. And then, of course, people behind the scenes. Anna is here, uh, Danielle Herb, and David Lamb. Thank you again so much. Thank and you. And I look forward to continuing the yeah, conversation. I'll email you that yep. framework. Yes. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah.